Welcome everyone to Authors Bantering. Um, new set design. I hope you guys, <laughs> you guys all enjoy it. Uh, all right, this is Josh Brez. I'm here with Ian M. Rogers, and so this week we're going to be discussing the topic of how to conceptualize your book. Um, and I got to be honest. So when I first read this topic, I wasn't really sure what what you were talking about. So I'm gonna let Ian take it from here and start off first. No, that. This is, um, and again, a scary word like conceptualization, I think, can be really off-putting. But again, I know you and I have talked about this before. Conceptualization is just this idea of knowing what kind of book you're going to write okay. as you're writing it or before you're writing it. So again, this is stuff like knowing the conventions of your genre. And when I say genre, I mean if you're going to write a YA book. You okay. Know, know basically, what a YA book should do, yeah. or if you're going to write, you know, a a high science fiction book, you know, knowing the conventions of that and how it how it goes. And there's, you know, this covers basic things like length. Um, for example, you know, conventions or tropes. Um, yeah. you know, for example, um, romance novels. You know, knowing romance tropes, or you know, just the idea that every romance novel has to end with the characters getting together. If the characters don't get together at the end, it's not a romance novel. Yeah. yeah. You know? So if you want to write a novel like that, a, want to write a romance novel, um, or the idea that you have um, suits the conventions of a romance novel, you might want to think about other aspects of romance novels to make your novel fit that. That makes you know? sense. So. Um, when you say yeah, it now, yeah, yeah. So when you say that though, um, it sounds like the the very simple answer, right? The simple solution to this is simply just to read very, very, very widely within your genre, right? Just be very, very well, very well versed in it, so that you can kind of learn this the familiar patterns, right? Which which are tropes, but you probably might conceptualize yes. this as patterns of yes, I, what you're working on. I think on. that every writer owes it to themselves to, you know, when they're writing a certain kind of book to just read a lot of examples or things that are similar. Yep. And this also helps, you know, in things like query letters, but on the writing level, it helps you, you know, know what to avoid, um, know what other books are doing. Um, you know, you can copy things, but not copy too closely, you know, um, yeah. or think about books that are, that you like and that are like the story that you're working on and okay. kind of, kind of go from there, try, try and explore those conventions. Gotcha. So if you're going to go further than just the reading part of it, I, what I think will help a lot of people in terms of discovering, you know, like the formats of their genre, conceptualizing it is doing copy work, which I know nobody ever wants to freaking do it. I feel like I feel like I'm the only person that ever does this. Um, which is basically where you read, you take a book that you enjoy, like a book that you know that's in your genre, and you actually practice typing out that book. You actually write that book out as an exercise. Um, I think doing that will start to give you a feel for the deeper elements. Because yeah, you can know the word count. You can study the word count. You can study. Like you can study, you know, um, the pages. You can study the tropes of it and all that stuff. The thing that that goes deep, the thing that you have to do for your genre, though, more than that, though, is you have to see how an author actually spins their magic, right? How do they format, you know, how do sentences, right? In your genre, how do sentences look? How do paragraphs look? How do openings usually start? How to how do you know chapters usually begin? Is it usually like in the first person or third person point of view? Um, how is information the conveyed? That, the, the idea that copying the book out, you know, actually typing it out, forces you to pay more attention. To you those do. Kinds things that you might otherwise miss you learn the smaller details the absolutely yeah I, I, you also learn the beats too i mean the thing that nobody talks about especially with, with, with like genres and all is learn the beats right the beats of you know a sci-fi story or a fantasy story is much different than like you know certainly a a, a lit fix story usually right it's different than a ya you know the, the how things plot how plots move forward is very, very different. Um, if you're writing, if you're if you're learning a mystery, right? Obviously, beats are the most, <laughs> by the most important thing in a mystery novel, right? Because you have to know, at one point, when does the murder happen? You know, when do they almost catch the bad guy? When do they get their first clues? It, it, it's yes. by going through and doing copywork, you're you're picking up not just those things, but you're picking up just the intrinsic way the story is being told. You're you're sort of learning basically, all right, this is how this person tells a story. These are the subjects, these are the areas that the that the author is shining a light on in, in all these different tales. So you can go further yes. than just knowing just the basics. You know, any any robot can can learn that, you know, the basics I'm, of it. It takes skill to figure out the inner workings of your genre. I'm I'm thinking of that saying that the first time we read something we read for plot and then the second time we read, we read for everything else. 
You yeah. Know, the idea that when we read a book for the first time, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, we can become engrossed in it and we'll, we'll follow along. And then the second time we read a book, we know what's going to happen or basically what's going to be, yeah. what's going to happen if it was a long time ago and we forgot. And so it lets us look more closely at things like language, yes. beats, opening, character, you know? So if, if you're, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, copy out a book, why would I want to waste my time doing that? Or that it feels very abhorrent to you. You know, I've never copied out a book. Um, but I have read books multiple times and gotten a closer look at what they're doing. A close and reading, I think yeah. Just that forces you to slow down and think about the books more rather than focusing on, okay, I read 50 books last year and I read them all once and I don't remember 48 yeah. of them, you know. Exactly. And and that's the oh. thing is, and that's the thing I'm trying to impress on people when I discuss this is that exact thing, which is <sighs> – most people, when they read books, the average layman reads a book. It's like they look at a house, right? You're looking at a house, and you, and you just see the super, you see the outside of the house. You can you can do a tour of the house and all that stuff. That's awesome. If you're an author, you can't just look at the house. You got to tear the walls down. You got to see the wiring inside. You got to see the foundation. You got to inspect um, where all of like the studs in the walls are. You have to know where all of the framing is done, right? You have to figure out the different type. Really, the the different mechanics that went into build your, your house. You have to figure all that out and you have to know how it was done. Um, yes. And you don't get that necessarily just by reading, just by reading the same way everyone else reads, because all you're going to do is you're going to just see the house on the outside. You have yes. to actually tear the walls down and get in there and actually look at it and, and be able to figure out why is something done this way? Why is the author written the story this particular way? And what's the benefit of it? And what are they trying to do with that, that technique that they're, that they're using? Yeah. But yes, I think you you made a really good point. And I don't want to let it um, let it slip by. Is that most people do not read that way? No, they don't. Most people just read for story, or they read for fun, or they read to figure out what happens. Which you know, is they awesome. Don't read yeah. to dissect the yeah. way the way writers should or do. Yeah, for and for for the layman, that's awesome because I don't want. No magician wants an audience full of magicians, right? Like I want nobody to know how I'm doing yeah. these techniques here. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, as the an author though, you can't. Know, but to talk about a magician, for example, yeah. a magician a magician goes to another magician show and yes. looks at how the tricks were done. Bingo. And he tries to pick things out. I was talking about this with my barber a few days ago. Oh, okay. This idea that he was saying that once he became a barber, he started to notice people's haircuts. Yeah. He'd notice good haircuts. He'd notice bad haircuts. He'd notice particular styles. He'd notice, you know, particular ways things were done because yep. he was learning the skills of how haircutting worked. And so yeah. he could observe it in other people. And with writing, it's the exact same way, you know, looking at how books are set up and what they're doing, learning yep. how to do that. And I think is an incredibly valuable skill. It is. And it's unfortunate that, that you, at least for me, I can never go back now. I can't like, I'd love to be able to read certain books just as, as like a fan, like just as, as a, as a, just as someone that's still layman, but now I'm all, I'm still analyzing. I'm still, I can't turn that part of my brain off. And I think it's, someone's told me that once you go meta with anything, you'll never go back. In other words, once you once you understand the mechanics, right? The film goer, the, the 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 filmmaker, right, will never watch a movie as a regular person ever again. They're always looking to see lighting effects, story, whatever, right? It's the same thing with an author. I I don't know many people people that I'd love to have that skill, but I can never go back now to just reading a book as a regular person anymore. Um, which yeah, it's a, it's it's a tragic I guess thing, whatever. But like. The opposite of, of it is that I now understand my craft way better than someone that, that, that doesn't study that kind of thing. Going um, going back to this idea of conceptualization, yeah. um, kind of the, where uh, where we had started and the idea of you know making strong choices about what you want your book to be and, and, um, and what you want your book to look like. So we just talked about you know knowing books and knowing the conventions and figuring out how things worked. Um, I think there's also something to be said about making strong choices initially yes. about what you want your book to look yeah. like. So one thing that I used to do a lot and that I now notice a lot in other writers are writers who maybe read a lot, like read a lot of different kinds of books, which is, of course, a good thing. Like I'm all for mm -hmm. reading different kinds of books, but then we'll maybe try and borrow something from here and something from there. And, you know, a little bit from romance and a little bit from yeah. sci-fi and a little bit from young adult and a little bit from experimental fiction and a little bit from literary. And so what can often happen in those cases is that the book might feel very misfitty 
you know, it won't read like a sci-fi book or it won't read like literary fiction or it won't be quite experimental enough to be experimental and it won't be quite, you know, genre enough for, for genre. And so you can end up with something that one is very difficult to pitch to agents, but then also on a fundamental level, it won't resonate quite with how we as readers imagine books to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're creating this sort of Frankenstein's monster of like different, you know, of this book here because it's brought from so many different things where they thought they were being original. But what happens is you have something that has no identity at all. Um, yes. And, and that, some, that, that some can pull sad, it off. Some can oh, pull it oh, off. Ahead. What's that? Oh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I was saying some people can pull that off, but I think, yeah, more, more often than not, you're better off erring on the side uh, of being too much in your genre than trying to blend a bunch of different ones together. Yeah. Yes. I think that, yes, some people can pull it off. I think experienced writers can pull it off. I think that works that mix mix genres in a very conscious kind of way, like from page one all the way to the end and are very deliberate about how they do that. I think those books can very be very successful. Mm -hmm. Um, To quote a literary fiction example, James Joyce's Ulysses does this where it borrows from all these different (laughs) ways of writing from that time and from before. You know, part of it is written like a women's magazine romance novel. Part of it's written as if it were in a newspaper. Um, He copies all these different writers kind of from the creation of the English language, you know, to um, uh, to the 1920s, you know, when he was um, when he was writing it. And so if you're doing that consciously, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do there. But if you're kind of just starting out and you're, you know, working on a first book or, you know, working on a story that you are not, you don't have those skills to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, You would be better off, I think, to make a stronger choice um, and then try and fit it within those conventions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's, you you say a choice, right? Like someone that could pull that off. That's, you know, you you decided basically the, the, the probably the greatest author of the English language, right? <laughs> like, I mean, uh, I some would say, some would say, I I I it's good, okay. that's contentious, right? Well, there. I was gonna say Ulysses, I could not, I, I actually have a hard time reading. I can't really, I like forty percent of that, I can basically grasp. It's long, it's long it, and it's, difficult, yeah. and you, you you need readers guides to get. You through do. That's it's exactly so right. That's what I'm saying. It's such a difficult start, but, but that's um, that's also part of the part of what we were talking about there, right? If you're gonna borrow from the genre, is that you are gonna create this sort of monster here? And again, if you're really if you're brilliant, you can maybe pull it off, but more often than not, you, you again just side with, with your genre. Know your genre inside it out. Like study it, read it. That's the best way to figure it out. And staying with that, uh, within those parameters, I think works very well. And then you can slowly venture out. It's like the the adage about you know learn the rules before you can break the rules. You know when it comes yes. to the creative works. Yes, I. Um, the the last thing I want to say about conceptualization is I think that if you understand what kind of book you're writing and working on, mm-hmm. it's easier to talk about it with others. Yeah. When I say others, I mean just other writers, people you meet on the street. And then also when it comes time to, you know, pitching to presses, pitching to agents, you know, talking about it, you can speak about your book more confidently. If you yeah. can say, okay, I'm writing a high fantasy novel. I'm writing a middle grade novel. I'm writing a romance novel. Um, and it's not so much about filling in the blanks. It's about being able to talk about your story's plot, talk about what it's doing, what it's maybe not doing, mm. talk about it in terms of your goals for where you want the book to go. Yeah. And if you can understand how books are conceptualized and how books fit within this you know, huge genre system that we've evolved over hundreds and hundreds of years, I think you'll be able to talk about your own work in a way that really, really catches people's attention and that it makes it easier for them to follow Mm. as opposed to you having to, you know, explain 17 things about how it's different from this and kind of like that and has these conventions and, you know, people, people are busy. They don't, they don't have time for that. And it's too, you know, confusing to listen to an explanation like that. Exactly. And I think it's a good point, right? You know, if you are looking to be traditionally published, especially looking to pitch agents, editors, and you are a first time author, it does, it's a lot easier to pitch something that, that is familiar, that is very familiar, that is within the genre than something that is beyond it. Um, yeah, it, it's, yes, I, I, I imagine something like that, something like we just said would be a nightmare for a first time author to try and get published. It's yes, probably possible, I, but. You, you're speaking to this idea that, you know, when, um, when writers pitch agents, you know, they have to have comp titles, you know, this idea that um, you cite books that have come out within the last, you know, one to three years or one to five years, depending on who you, um, who you listen to, um, books that are similar to yours. 
And the agent can then look at those books, look at the sales, and then look at, okay, I've read that book and I like that book, or at least, you know, have an idea of this book just Mm -hmm. from, you know, reading the Amazon description or whatever. And so they can imagine your book fitting in with that. Yes. And it makes an agent able to, one, pick up your book with more confidence because they know what to expect, or two, pass on the book, not because they sense that it's not good, but because it's not for them. Yeah. Which I think there's something to be said for that versus like, oh, I don't think this writer kind of has it together. Yeah. Versus, oh, uh, this writer wrote probably a good book, but it's just not for me. Yeah. I've gotten a few of those before my, my life. <laughs> it's, yes. it's, no, but it's, you're exactly right. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's knowing the reason for rejecting is obviously very, very important there. And if it is because of that, you may have to unfortunately re-examine your own work as well, right? If everyone's passing on it because of that, for that particular reason, you may have to rewrite your work to make it fit more of that genre. Um, it's, it's a tough call as a, as a creator. You don't ever want to compromise in your art, but I mean, if that is your goal there and it is too far from the familiar, no one's going to buy it there. Or it's, it's, it'd be, it's very, very hard to sell any kind of copies. Um, again, yes. And, the more experience you are, the more the more you can take risks. That's just that's just the nature of the beast that is publishing. Well, no, that that of that of course is very true. I, I think um, you know I certainly don't mean to scare readers away and saying like oh they have to, my book has to be like every other book yeah. because I think there's still plenty of room for unique original writing within the kind of conceptualizations that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we've all seen you know books that are very formulaic and are just trope after trope after trope yeah. and and so on. Um, but I think it's still possible to have books that are creative, that are original, that do great things, as long as the writer makes strong choices about what the book is imagined to be and where it fits Yes. in a labyrinthine Amazon category description, where mm-hmm. it uh, fits on a physical bookshelf at an indie bookstore or at a Barnes and Noble, yep. you know, how a marketer would talk about that book, how the back of the book would talk about that book what kind of reader specifically would be the ideal reader for that book and that's mm-hmm. um and understanding that and making strong choices about that and again it's not about you know building a formulaic book or making a book that's exactly like other books it's knowing where your book fits in with the literary landscape yeah. that i'm getting at here yeah very good yeah and i so i to summarize all that it's knowing your genre like it's, it's actually it's reading it and you're you there's no way to figure it out but to read it you know <laughs> um yes. and so with that if you want to go as far as do copyright like i suggested awesome but at the very minimum you have to be well read in your genre yes. um not just one book not just a couple it's like you have to pretty much know inside and out know who the best sellers are know what's know what they are doing for techniques and then trying your best to write a story that incorporates at least some of the core elements of that very cool. Yes. But with that, um, if you did enjoy this video, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Um, this is Ian Rogers. This is Josh Breslin. And I will be back next week with him um, to go over... I'm not sure yet. We'll come up with, <laughs> we'll come up with something here. Well, um, well, we've got a few ideas. I was going to say, we'll... and I guess the other thing too I always say is we take comments from the audience here. So like any topic you want to discuss, leave in the comment section. We can, we can look into doing a video on that as well. Um, but until then, I'll sign off here and we will see you next week. Take it easy.